you know what I find ironic is last year everyone was concerned that if the Fed cut interest rates, it's because the economy was slowing and we're going to recession. Now the concern is that the Fed cuts interest rates, it's just going to put like lighter fluid on an already hot financial market. So it's amazing what a difference a year makes. Um, and the same act that the Fed can make is actually going to have a completely different effect now based on what the analysis is out there. Well, you know, I don't know, guys, you know, history tends to repeat itself, right? We have a new technology to hype. Um, you know, we have a significant liquidity, right? I mean, the, the growth of M2 is the largest in history. Um, you've got outperformance and bubblicious things like cryptocurrencies. And, um, you know, you got a lot of enthusiasm on the part of the individual investor, a lot of risk taking. Yeah. I don't know. Um, maybe there's a reason why that uh, you're on the other day, right? They're calling you a perma bull. How about you were right? Is it? Is that okay? <laughs> Anybody you allowed to Rob? say, hey, Rye, you were right. <laughs> Any way you can pander me on this show is good. Yes. Um, but no, I think, you know, we're in some sort of like, you know, high liquidity, high, just uh, wild type of market because gold's actually up. <laughs> yep. You know, you all. need... You need a lot of money out there to make gold go up because gold doesn't do anything. It's an, it's an everything market right now, Chris. Yeah, and actually, I've gotten uh, I've gotten a number of calls on gold uh, over the last week from uh, from some of my clients. <laughs> it's always <Yeah>. so telling. <laughs> yeah, well, the like, thing is, you know, over you know, over weighting, um, you know, seven stocks, you know, and and like that's twenty eight percent of the SSP, S and P. It's a thirty five year high in terms of concentration. It's like you know everybody just kind of ignores the risk. Like all of a sudden. Right, Apple's down 11, 12 percent because the Department of Justice is coming out against them. You know, Tesla is down like 22 percent because you know, there's another company in China that's selling cars more cheaply, um, and they actually look a lot alike. I kind of find that interesting. I think you brought that up before. China's a great copier of technology, but you know, the, the other thing it's interesting too is when things start going really, really well in the markets. It's just amazing how risk gets ignored or forgotten. And I know we talk about NVIDIA a lot, but that stock was down 50% just two years ago. Uh, during the great financial crisis, it was down 70%. And during the dot-com bubble, it went down 80%. And a lot of that has to do with just how cyclical semiconductor stocks are, right? I mean, chip demand for semiconductors can be wildly hot. And you, know, you can have supply, it's really, really low, or vice versa. We had a glut of chips uh, during the pandemic. Uh, where you know no one could sell their move their inventory, so it, like, these are wildly swinging uh, industries, and good can go to bad really really quickly. But people forget that when you're in a big booming bull market. Yeah, a lot of conversations I've been having with my clients, especially over the past week, they've had a lot of money come due from bonds maturing, and uh, you know the question I've been getting is like, you know, Chris, shouldn't we put some more money into these uh, big tech stocks that are doing really well? I said, sure, we can. I said, but um, you know, when the market's down forty percent and some of these things take a big hit, and you guys need money, do you want me to sell? Well, you know, I think you guys said last week it's a uh, you know the markets are unforgiving, right? They go nowhere for a while, and then you have these gigantic spikes. You know, we just had five months in a row. We just had one of the best quarters in history, um, but it really isn't that way. What it does, it doesn't go sideways and and just go quiet. It punishes everybody. It, it forces <laughs> every weak holder out, right? Every weak hand is forced out of the market. Um, you, know, you know, how many times have you guys heard in your career? I just can't take it anymore. You know, I just want to sit back and wait till <laughs> things settle down. Well, as we always say, they settle up. I mean, it's amazing. It's just like shakes out all the weak holders and puts the market into strong hands. And then it just ramps up and people sit there with their money in the money market at $6 trillion dollars you know, becoming more and more green with envy on a daily basis. Kind of reminds me back during the pandemic, you know, when the market dropped 35, 40%, one of my clients said, Chris, you know, who's, who's buying in the market right now? Who's buying this stuff? And I said, well, I am. I said, the best companies in the world are on sale. Please, I'll take more of that. It, it's just so hard to comprehend that because you're right, like two, two years or 24 months of a market going sideways feels like an eternity to most investors. And everyone forgets, you know, it was just two falls ago. It was like in October uh, of 2022 when everyone was about to give up on the market. Like I was getting calls about like, what can we go with some of these structured product strategies that the brokerage firms have where I get, you know, X amount of the upside, but I don't get the downside, just looking for some sort of edge. Um, but meanwhile, you're right, Bob, like the best strategy is just sit and wait, be patient because man, oh man, the darkest hour is right before the dawn when things move in the opposite direction. 
They just move violently. And you're right. You're just sitting cash and you wait and wait and wait. And you think you're going to get an opportunity to get in. You just never get it. That's why markets are cruel, period. Well, I know I know. in the last low, we did our fireside chat because the advisors were getting a lot of pushback and there was a lot of stress on the part of investors because as opposed to today, everything was going down, you know, like a, for three months. Well, God forbid it was going down for three months. Um, and, you know, we were talking about not only was the market at a really good price point, but most likely we would see 40,000 on the Dow you know, before we'd see it, you know, go much lower and we're heading on, you know, heading into that now, but you know, it's amazing. It's like four years ago, maybe three years ago during COVID, we get down to 18,000, I mean, 18,000. And now we're going to close at 40,000. Um, <laughs> and it's like, well, I, you know, I'm investing for 30, 40 years, but I can't handle a two year period of volatility. <laughs> you know? Bull market years are like dog years, you know, for every one bull market year, it feels like seven years of regular years. But that's it. You know, the market goes up 75% of the time. Um, you know, it doesn't average 10, right? It has these extreme moves uh, and you just have to be in. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just incredible. Uh, if, you, if you just look how, how the individual investor behaves, it never changes. In all fairness, hedge funds and institutional investors too are, are not that smart. <laughs> if you look That's at true. where they place their money too, they had too much money in cash going into this bull market. Now you're seeing a lot of these same hedge funds and institutions just loading up on the same stocks that individuals are. And that's the problem, right? You get everybody on the same side of that trade that eventually when there's no more money left to go on that trade, and there's no one on the other side of that trade. That's when these things can fall apart and it can happen very quickly. And it's going to happen, you know, without anyone warning you ahead of time. And that's why, like, we always talk about max diversification. That's your only protection against it because there's just no way. Like I, I was making this joke the other day. I don't know anybody that told me, oh, yeah, back in 2000, I sold pets.com. And AOL at the top <laughs> and put all my money into real estate. All you hear people say about when you say, remember the tech bubble? Oh, yeah, yeah. I got destroyed <laughs> in mm -hmm. the tech bubble. Um, you know, that, and that's what happens, right? It's always too late. And it's always trying to find that, that magical top. And no one's going to tell you ahead of time. So you just want to be proactive with your strategy and start thinking, you know, into the future. In the future, things are going to look a lot different. Yeah, you buy those, uh, those, old, those old horrible companies, right? Those steady dividend payers. Uh, it's a really horrible way to place to be in the market. But, you know, we warned, I think on this podcast, we warned people a couple of years ago about private equity. Look what's happened with private equity now. When we said all of a sudden institutions were being very kind and opening up their, their private equity funds, you know, to retail investors, you know, like what could go wrong there? And sure enough, you know, all of a sudden there's no liquidity, right? There's There's been very little IPO activity, very little M&A activity. So there's more money in private equity locked up right now which can't get can exit because there's nobody to sell it to, um, you know, in, in, in the last two or three years. So it's just, it's like anything else. You stick to the basics, stick to the fundamentals, you know, diversify. I mean, it's, it's never been a better time. I, you know, we've been talking about this once in a generation opportunity, you know, to, to um, massively, you know, diversify your portfolio and get away from these concentrated portfolios. And most investors are going to miss it, right? Most investors yeah. are going to follow the momentum right now. And, you know, you look at international stocks, they trade at like a 33% discount to the U.S. Mm -hmm. The earnings yield, not to get wonky, is at like 7% versus 4.7 for U.S. stocks. So it's like every metric tells you right now that like the global markets are extremely cheap, but because they've done nothing, actually they've moved, but relative to what the U.S. has done, they haven't done much investors are just not going to have the discipline to say, all right, let me buy what's out of favor here. Let me be patient because I have to go to that cocktail party and I want to be in the mix. So if I'm talking about international stocks, no one's going to talk to me. Well, you know, you guys, if you don't realize it or not, but it was 24 years ago when the bubble burst. Wow. Right. So it's, it's like uh, the old cynical saying on Wall Street is, you know, every 25 years, the sheep need to be shorn. So, you know, there's no institutional memory. There's tons of new investors out there that don't remember the last tech bubble. Like you said, right, some investors do, you know, yeah. more of my generation or older. But, you know, the younger generation, they don't know anything about a tech bubble. They don't know about a lost decade where you have the S&P 500 return, a negative annual rate of return for 10 years. I mean, you know, meanwhile, you can make money consistently if you stick to that, 
you know, massive, you know, diversification, broad diversification that we keep talking about, which people want to shun right now. They absolutely want to shun it. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Like, you know, if you had that lost decade, if you're just holding one thing or you're not getting any dividends, it's, uh, there's no really impetus to stay in. Yeah. And that's why you need to be balanced. Well, I would argue even those who went through it, forget it. Yeah. And yes. I mean, it's like, it's like everything comes full circle. Like you couldn't have things line up almost the same in 1998. The Fed unnecessarily cut interest rates, just like they're going to do today, <laughs> that added fuel to the fire. You had one company that was supplying all the, the networking equipment for the internet, uh, Cisco back then, that was just the hot darling stock, just the same way NVIDIA is today. You have Michael Saylor with his company, MicroStrategy, that just bought like more Bitcoin than like any company on earth. His company lost more money than the dot-com bubble than almost like any other company in one day. <laughs> so it's all the same characters. <laughs> all doing the same thing again, yet nobody can see that. And probably, you know, we, there's nothing new on Wall Street. It's probably going to end the same way. Well, you know, it's really funny, like 2022, uh, which was the worst year, you know, for a balanced strategy in 40 years, maybe, maybe in history. Uh, and, you know, we tried to take advantage of it by doing tax swaps during that period of year. And I remember speaking to an accountant that I work with a lot of his clients. And we had two or three clients. They said, ah, no, Bob, we, we don't want to do any tax swaps. And I said, why? I, I still have a half a million dollar tax loss carry forward from, from the 90s. I mean, <laughs> you, know, people, you know, people have lost that much money are still writing that off. Um, you know, here we are at 24, 25 years later. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 155, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence. We'll literally build your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll build you an income plan if you're getting ready for retirement. We'll show you how to take Social Security the best way for you. We'll show you how to draw from your portfolio, factor in inflation, so you don't run out of money, a full dynamic income plan. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile the last couple of years. Has your portfolio been up and down like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, we're gonna show you how to protect it over the rest of your life. And we're going to look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, insurance products, structured products, brokerage products. We'll literally do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan. Simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or go to the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. So Bob and Chris, I thought we could talk about the top five strategies that everyone needs to be thinking about in 2024 to make sure that they're on track for their financial independence plan or retirement plan, depending where you are in life. And I think, you know, number one is understanding the sequence of returns. Like we know we go through big bull markets, bear markets. And one of the biggest concerns that we see is what if you go into retirement and all of a sudden you have a big bear market and you need to draw from your portfolio and all of a sudden you're selling when your shares are low and that can have a horribly negative impact on your literally the rest of your retirement. Well, I mean, that's a, that's the thing. It's like markets don't move in a straight line. Uh, we talk, spoke about that earlier. Um, it's almost as if you know the market wants you to get out, right? <laughs> it's like that's create enough stress hit your stress points so that, uh, you know, you don't stay invested. That's why it's so important to invest based on a strategy, based on your goals, because it's, um, you know, if you're going to put away money to educate a child or a grandchild, you, know, you don't jump in and out of the market because you know you have that tuition payment that's going to be due at some point in the future. So it's always best to have a strategy where you're investing based on a goal as opposed to trying to be right every day. Well, that's why max diversification is so important. And I think most investors don't understand this because yes, if you have a live by the sword, die by the sword strategy, like we see a lot of people have today, 
like let's say you have all your money in the S and P 500 or growth stocks. Well, all of a sudden, if they all go down when you're about to retire, you're out of luck, right? So I think the idea is you've got to have different asset classes that work at different times. Like in 2022, even though the market was down, if you had income coming off your portfolio, well, the market being down didn't affect that. If you had like commodity and energy exposure in your portfolio, other things that weren't the S and P 500, they were actually up. You could draw from. You should never be in a position where your whole portfolio is down at once. That's called bad diversification. If that's the case, and that's how most people invest. Yeah. It also, it also allows you to take advantage of opportunities in the market. You know, if you've got certain things in your portfolio that are outperforming and other things that are underperforming, uh, you can take profits from those things that are doing well and buy into things that are that are down. Well, you know, guys, they always say there's never a permanent dip in any asset class in the market. Um, but it doesn't stop folks when you see something that goes up 100%, right? I've never seen anything go up 100% and then go up 100% the next year. But when they report these different funds and investments in these different areas, like like Morningstar, they show you the, you know, the five-year and 10-year, three-year average rate of return. Well, people realize they, they factor in that one big year and it makes it look like, <laughs> you know, oh, no, Bob, this has been great yeah. for 10 years. Look at the return. I'm going, no, <laughs> I had horrible years in between that 100% return. And, and that, that, that can yeah. be a big mistake. It's a great point. That's where consistency of return is so much more important, right? Because if you're retired, you can't afford just have one good year of return, lots of bad years of return. It doesn't make sense. And that's why most of us don't invest based on our goals. We have bet based on a, on a track record, which has nothing to do with our goals. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes retirees are going to make right now going into retirement because right now there's only certain parts of the market that are hot. And what does our industry do? They're only going to recommend what's done well recently. And that's a recipe for disaster, as we know. Well, you're right, Rod. We have our, like our large cap growth portfolio is our star performer this year up close to 12 percent. But, you know, right behind on its heels are the um, is our pipeline, you know, MLP pipeline index portfolio that's up 10 percent, but it yields 5 percent where our, our growth portfolio yields a half of 1 percent. And if you look over the last three years, right, our pipeline index way outperformed, you know, the tech stocks that are so hot right now. So it's, it, you know, it, sometimes you inadvertently end up with an outperformer without trying. I think that's, that's probably a better way to do it. It's a, better to be, you know, um, I guess, educationally lucky, you know, than uh, to try and outsmart the market. Well, more to the point is you want to make your portfolio more pension-like when you're going to live off of it. And most of us don't look at it that way, but it's a, you need income in retirement, a pension creates income. And that's what you have to start to think. You know, the other big issue in retirement that you have to think about when you're getting prepared for it is inflation. And right now, if you're getting 5% on a money market fund, well, you have to pay taxes on that. And then you have 3% inflation on top of that. You're basically getting a 0% return right now. You have to think about that when you're growing your portfolio for retirement. Well, that's like the opposite side of that risk conversation. You, know, you can take too much risk in the stock market, but taking too little risk can be a risk too, just because to your point, Rai, you're not making above and beyond inflation and you won't have as much longevity in your portfolio. Well, you know, it's getting interesting right now because of inflation, you know, gold's finally get, get caught a bid and uh, it's actually going up this year, even though it's historical rate of return is horrible. Um, but, you know, people are buying gold as a supposed hedge against inflation, which has never been proven to be a hedge against inflation. But I saw a great article the other day, somebody went to Costco and bought a gold bar and then went to a car dealer to try to buy a card and a car dealer wouldn't take the gold. So he returned <laughs> it to Costco. Right. And the same thing with, you know, what are you going to buy with Bitcoin and what are you going to buy with relative performance? Right. You know, our real estate values are up dramatically. You ever go try to buy groceries with your relative performance of your home? I mean, it's just you need cash flow, as you said earlier, guys. Yeah, no, no, 100 percent. And I like the idea of uh Gold to hedge against smart investing. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> that's, all, that's all it's good for. You know, the, the other big issue, too, that we find, and I think this is something that doesn't get run in your financial projections enough, is the healthcare game plan, right? I mean, in retirement now, Fidelity is estimating that a couple is probably going to need something like $315,000 in unexpected medical expenses. So you have to ask yourself, that came out of your portfolio tomorrow, is that going to affect your lifestyle when you're finally financially independent? I'd argue for most people, they haven't run those numbers. And you know, if you think about it, some of these skilled care facilities can run as much as ten thousand a month, above and beyond what your base expenses are. Well, see, I, I ran my projections, but I, I kind of ignore them 
because uh, I decided that you two guys will be my caregivers and I'm going to pay you per hour what you pay me now. So I'm going to work you like dogs and pay you like puppies <laughs> you know, when I'm sitting that's around, like, you know, my bathrobe complaining. Hey, let's, let's, let's cart dad into the closet for the day. He's, uh, he's complaining too much. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what's, what's, what, what would be different from let's now? Wheel him in there. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, all kidding aside, guys, and we, you know, we, we speak to clients every day that are, you know, going to these uh, assisted living facilities and, or they're, they're taking their parents and grandparents, and it's just the numbers are just scary high. Um, if you can get in, you know, it's like usually a waiting list, right? So it's 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 pretty amazing. Yeah, I think any of these plans and projections that we receive from you know new onboard clients, their their other uh, planners weren't incorporating those healthcare costs. I mean, it's like ignoring inflation, you know, in a, in a wealth projection. You really have to factor it in. It's it's we're living longer, um, and but not necessarily healthier. And uh, you definitely have to have a plan, whether you're going to self-insure or you're going to have some outside uh, help in, in insuring those costs. Yeah. And that's a, that's a question, right? You have to run the numbers. Is it better to self-insure or not? And there's no easy answer to that, right? It's different for everybody. So there's not just a one hard, fast rule when it comes to that. You know, the other big issue is when it comes to retirement that everyone needs to address right now is, are you maximizing all your plans? Maybe you're down the home stretch here, maybe in your 50s, maybe in your early 60s. And all of a sudden now we can put a lot more money away in our retirement plans. And that's something you want to be optimizing. It's some of the only good tax benefits we have uh, when trying to build wealth for retirement. And most of us probably aren't maxing those out. Yeah. And it's not just retirement plans. It's also things like healthcare savings accounts. I mean, we're talking about how expensive healthcare is going to be. You know, if you're eligible for a health savings account, you know, you can, you can put that money in pre-tax and you can roll it over year over year. That money can be used to cover expenses in retirement. And it's just not your plan. I mean, take a look at your children and your grandchildren's plans. You know, a lot of times that uh, with the cost of living so high, you have someone coming out of college, just getting started. Um, they're, they're probably not going to be able to economically afford, you know, to fund their 401k or their HSA because um, they also want to be able to make a car payment and, and pay these exorbitant rents that are out there. So not a bad idea to start doing some gifting to the next generation to help them out. So it's, again, it's maximizing the total plan. And I still think guys, this, these 529 plans are underutilized. Um, I just, uh, I just think it's a great place, you know, to grow money tax free. Yeah, it really is. And Bob, I really, really like the idea of one generation gifting to the other generation. Just a great concept. Yeah. Liam, he thanks me every day. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Ryan's waiting for his check. <laughs> All right, it's the Hidden Facts of Finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, Bentleys aren't cheap. At an entry-level model costs around $216,000 with customers typically paying some $43,000 more in options. The company told Barron's recently that one, cu one customer requested paint work to match her nail varnish. <laughs> Another <laughs> option took the price up to $610,000 while well, third party paid $2.17 million. Man, oh man, that's really bespoke. Yeah, last I checked, um, you know, cars are a depreciating asset. Um, you know, they, they drop dramatically as soon as you drive them off the car lot. But, uh, you know, according to my buddy Harold over in Palm Beach, he said, uh, you know, Bentleys are nothing more than the Palm Beach Ford. Everybody has one, including him. <laughs> Well, hopefully his nail polish doesn't match the, the car. It could be, it could be questionable. <laughs> well, truth be but told, hey. he did buy it for his spouse. <laughs> All right, Chris. 10 years ago in 2014, J.P. Morgan Chase, which gathers statistics filed by the country's 100 biggest corporate pension funds, shows them to be 82% funded. As of the end of last year, they're up to 99.5%, essentially fully funded. That's actually probably one of the positives with markets going up right now and interest rates going up is pensions are actually back to being fully funded. That's a good thing. Well, that's a big relief because, Dad, I know that you have a pension from Merrill Lynch, and now you can finally afford that Palm Beach Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a real Ford with that pension. <laughs> All right. Well, another great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 155, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please spread it around. Let your friends know about it. If you're listening to this on iTunes or I Apple Music, Please give us a five-star rating. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe. If this is on YouTube, you can like this episode. You can subscribe to our channel. Click that notification bell to be updated of all our new content. 
Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 